go. Uh, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, this talk is going to be about something that uh, I've, I've shared in one, and, uh, two or three occasions, but which is a very new topic, one that's underappreciated, but one which I believe is going to be have explosive implications for dynamic modeling over the next decade or two. And um, it's one that I almost, I feel it would be remiss, particularly for a boot camp like this, to not talk about it. Um, and the title of the talk, yes, uh, hurts back to a comment by epidemiologist Bill Zuckerman in the States, um, who said that models without data are myth, data without models are madness. <laughs> um, and uh, the subtitle of, of this is Dynamic Health Policy Modeling in the Age of Big Data. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, broadly speaking, we're seeing a, a, a collision course in a positive sense between data science and system science at the present time. Um, uh, distinct communities of practitioners, with a handful of exceptions. Um, uh, we have very different methods um, that seem to be addressing some overlapping questions and many very different questions. And I would argue, I would submit, that the next decade or two is going to be going to be one of its most distinguishing features is going to be the melding of these different approaches in very exciting ways. So that the models that we're building 10 years hence, 20 years hence, using tools such as we've been seeing, agent-based modeling, system dynamics, discrete event modeling, um, the models will be more compelling richer, more deeply grounded, um, and more, more robust in their, um, in their results. We're dealing uh, these days with, with challenges of growing complexity. I don't need to talk about this again because I alluded to these uh, yesterday. But you know, the challenges that we're facing as a world are not the challenges that, that uh, public health um, in the health science community we're facing 25, 30 years ago predominantly. They're, they're, they're more um, troubling, interlinked, tangled, um, vexing, um, and in some cases they result from, from problems that we created. Um, you know, when we have, uh, for example, uh, the occurrence of, of opioid epidemic in North America, in large part created by prescription overuse, um, where we have antibiotic resistant organisms circulating in long-term care facilities as well as in the food chain. Um, these are things that, that emerge from our own missteps, not merely from features of a, of a dangerous world um, out there. And we talked yesterday about how systems, a characteristic of a complex system is not only that it's, that it's, um, uh, you know, uh, set of interconnections of the pieces, but the whole is greater than some of the parts. We can't merely reduce an understanding of the whole, like a traffic jam, to an understanding of each car in isolation. It doesn't, doesn't work. Um, we can't reduce an understanding of that backup in the ED merely to what's going on with each person in the ED, or even you know, to, to various aspects in the, in the system of the whole. They're interacting in, in complex ways, right? And this complexity makes it hard to explain what's observed, to make sense of it, to ask what's going on, and to formulate robust interventions. So I talked about this yesterday. Um, and, you know, some of those uh, in, in positions of, of authority have, have really highlighted this. And I think I have to credit the states um, for uh, the NIH in particular, for um, for helping to invest very heavily in system science methods, and in fact, um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, in the U.S., um, for recognizing this as well. And um, the director, a former director of the CDC, you know, had, had argued the need to move from and these are quotes, the static views of problems that are studied in isolation sort of siloed approach that we've made very good use of to dynamic systems and syndemic approaches, this view of sort of 
health as, as, as being driven by underlying processes that are evolving over time. And where we think about an intervention, we need to think about its effects over time um, and, uh, and the ways in which feedbacks might operate to other factors of, of, of parts of the system. Um, now, um, to address these needs, my group and many other groups around the world, and indeed an increasing community worldwide, have been applying rich decision-oriented simulation models. Um, and uh, these models, uh, whether built at an aggregate level, perhaps stratified, or built in a, at an individual base level, they help us to understand the implications of data for decision-making. Um, and you know, we talked this morning about the difference between individual-based models, which offer detailed longitudinal and cross-sectional views of population health, um, in contrast to aggregate models, which really provide a cross-sectional view over time of a community without being able to track particular individuals. And we noted some of the benefits for individual-based models. Um, but the thing here, ladies and gentlemen, is that models, modeling is an exercise often in, in theorizing. This is an operationalizable theory. And you know, Jeff commented um, over the break um, a topic that I had, or uh, something I'd mentioned yesterday at two or three points, but it's worth emphasizing that there's really no alternative to modeling. The question is, does the modeling go on in your head in a way that other people can't see, can't have access to, can't help refine, can't help critique um, in advance nearly as effectively? Or does it go on in an explicit way that can be shared, collectively refined and critiqued um, and advanced in a collective way. Um, so holding off modeling is really not holding off all modeling, it's holding off explicit shared modeling in preference for just what's in our heads and making decisions based on, on what is in our heads is not, has not been very successful in a lot of these areas. It's really fallen short. Um, so when we're engaging in modeling and we're engaging in sort of building theories, um, uh, as we've done over many, many different areas, this are some of our areas of work over the past uh, uh, the, the past um, uh, decade or so. A major barrier is that reliable evidence regarding health behaviors and exposures is hard to secure. We know that in many areas, maybe in nosocomial infection control, contact patterns between individuals and contacts with locations is important. Location is important for many reasons in different contexts. Access to resources, to care, barriers to activity, you know, physical activity, changes in the food environment that affect you know, my, my, uh, the availability of healthy foods, um, environmental risks such as pathogen reservoirs, cholera or MRSA on surfaces or what have you. Physical activity is something that um, uh, you know, it's of central interest for a lot of purposes, for obesity, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes, that's type of diabetes uh, first uh, applying during, um, during pregnancy, uh, as well as uh, for things like the risk of falls, and even for mental health issues. Uh, physical activity has uh, some very interesting interactions with, with um, mental, health, um, mental health concerns that some have investigated. Um, but we know in location and physical activity, people are comparatively poor in reporting reliably where they've been in the levels of physical activity. Studies we've run have shown a night and day difference between what physical measures suggest where people are versus where they report they are. <laughs> we, we, uh, so in one study conducted by, by uh, some of my colleagues um, using our system that I'll be describing, we looked at uh, undergraduates and asked basically where, where do you spend your time? Um, and uh, they, they said uh, three, three primary things. I spend the time in the library. <laughs> I'm a good student. I study hard. Um, I spend my time in the gym. I work out and I invest in my health. Um, and I spend my time, I think the third one was, uh, I spend my time uh, associated with, with friends, um, uh, you know, in the food area, social, socializing. You know, I'm, I'm, I have a good social networks and I'm popular. Um, and if we actually looked at where they spend their time, there was quite little, there was quite little 
um, relation uh, compared to where they actually spent their time. The amount of time they spent in the physical activity complex was minimal. Um, and the amount of time that they spent in the library was also <laughs> very, very limited. Um, they did spend a, quite a bit of time in the food courts um, <laughs> with the friends. They spent also a, a disproportionate amount in the bus area, um, going back and forth with buses and so on. So simple thing. I don't, I don't impute you know, um, strong efforts on confabulation on their part, but <clears throat> their ability to recall seems limited. Um, physical activity, we know from the NHANES 3 study, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Study in the States, where they first used accelerometers to complement people's self-reporting, that, that physical activity can be hugely distorted by people's statements. People will often overestimate how much physical activity. They say, oh, I like hockey. I like hockey. I'm a big, you know, I, I, I play hockey quite a lot. Maybe it's once a month, but they're treating it as if it's played multiple times a week because, you know, I'm a real hockey guy. Um, uh, I'm out there on the ice a lot. I'm a tough, tough man. Um, spatial proximity between individuals. We know this is really important for transmission of pathogens. Think transmission from, um, from a uh, nurse who's a carrier for MRSA to a patient in a long-term care facility. But it's also important for transmission of norms. Think uh, smokers, you know, uh, meeting up. Someone is struggling to stay quit, spending time next to someone um, who is in their old smoking group while, while they're, they're smoking. There's, there's implications there for they're likely to falling back, but also more broadly for transmission of norms involving uh, physical activity and, and nutrition, et cetera. Um, Social context, um, who you spend time with, we also found huge differences about who people reported as spending time with compared to who we actually detected using sensors we had deployed at the time they actually spent time with. Um, and I don't anticipate that being so much a matter of how they're imagining themselves. It's just they have very little ability to estimate how much time they spent with different people. Um, and they missed absolutely large numbers of people that they were with only fleetingly, you know, in the, in the line for the coffee, uh, the coffee place or what have you. Maybe they didn't notice them, or if they didn't notice them, that didn't really sink in, right? Um, one day blurs to the next. Um, and we know social context is, is very important. Uh, feelings of social support for physical activity have been one of those areas. Encouraging that has been one of these areas the CDC and the states identified as as very important as a, as a validated instrument for improving physical activity. Um, when it comes to perception of safety, social context is important, risk perception. Communication, um, uh, also, you know, people's communication behavior are sometimes um, hard to get a, um, a measurement of using traditional instruments, the decision making rules and heuristics, which may be very important for understanding how they would behave in a new intervention regime or with new incentives perhaps around physical activity or around, um, uh, around certain types of care-seeking behavior. We're, we're not sure sort of what rules, uh, using traditional instruments, it's hard to sample that uh, effectively. And finally, exposure to environments. How much time they're spending exposed to this physical, this built environment or that one, or this food environment. How much time they actually spend far, you know, near grocery stores as opposed to far away. And the challenge is that absent understanding these behaviors and exposures, the potential to quantitatively evaluate certain policy trade-offs is, is limited. Um, uh, we also have, in our day and age, not merely, uh, not merely those challenges, but we have situations that are becoming more difficult. Um, uh, I don't know what the situation is like in Australia, but in um, Can Canadian context, a lot of the larger uh, survey instruments that are run by the provinces, uh, for example, um, uh, use a random digit dialing, or they try to, to reach people by phone. And we're getting really limited response rates now. I think that the hit rate for, for a neighboring province in, in doing this is less than 10%. And the people that they do get are, to say the least, not representative of the population of a whole. You tend to oversample retired individuals. Um, it tends to be, it, it tends to be a gendered response too. Um, there's there's more women willing to take the call and, and talk and answer the questions, and it is far from representative for the whole population 
the people you got. Getting younger people, getting under, underrepresented groups, um, like uh, um, uh, individuals with low socioeconomic position, juggling several jobs, homeless people, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, uh, and um, at the same time, um, you know, there's, there's a great deal of interest in, in identifying group picks associated with adverse and risk behavior, but a difficulty reading, reaching them. But, you know, a big, a big goal here um, of interest to many of our partners is understanding the degree to which um, certain interventions realize outcomes, um, not only at a, at a high level, but how they realize their outcomes. So, I mentioned to you yesterday these studies, uh, the Moving to Opportunity study. Uh, one of our partners in the States was very instrumental in this. And, and you know, her work was looking at, at using housing vouchers and, and outcomes for these vouchers. So one of the big things she was interested in, the reason she collaborated with us, is trying to understand what, what are the predominant pathways by which obesity was being changed in these groups. So when they moved to a new neighborhood, was it predominant through moderate to vigorous physical activity? Was it, and if so, was it because of recreational space or, or neighborhood walkability, use of the sidewalks? Was it because they have access to more ball courts or just decent sidewalks? That has some implications for where they move and where to invest in the resources. To what degree was the change in obesity due to sedentary behavior change? Or perhaps how much of it was due to healthiness of diet and the fact that they're spending more time in, in, in home or in an area that has greater access to food, to good food. Um, if we understood the, the pathways to the effect, even if we have moderate outcomes, unimpressive outcomes for an intervention, we know how to improve it because we know, okay, you know, maybe we improve moderate to vigorous physical activity, but sedentary behavior also worsened. And we learn, okay, now that at least gives us a clue, even if we've had limited gain in the study, for how to do it better next time. We know what went wrong. We know which of the pathways we succeeded in nudging and which we fell flat. But a lot of these measures in, in the intermediate level are hard to reliably elicit through traditional instruments delivered once a month or once every quarter via phone to ask people, you know, how much sedentary behavior did you ha have you engaged in? How much moderate to vigorous physical activity? What was your diet been like? These are hard things to reliably elicit from individuals. And yet they're very important for understanding why we see, you know, limited, essentially no significant change for young men when they move to a new neighborhood. What gives? You know, what has changed? Where did it fall flat? Whereas young women, obesity levels have successfully been, been significantly reduced among young women. Why is that? Wh wh which causal pathways were the primary mediator for the gain so that we can improve our game next time in a better intervention? Without that knowledge about these intermediate steps, which are so difficult to measure with traditional instruments, um, we're not going to gain as much, nearly out of these interventions as we could. So my thesis here, my thesis statement is the advent of big data and health synergizes with and fundamentally enable dynamic modeling for health policy. We're going to be entering a different game, different world. Okay. Um, and I'd like to talk, having, having just mentioned that, I'd like to talk some about characteristics of big data. So when I talk about big data, what do, what do I mean? The term is a buzzword that I don't actually really like. Uh, when I first heard about big data, I, I really um, recoiled against the term. Because I'm an applications guy, I, I care about the applications of healthcare. I care about the health gains. And I care about other applications of this. And big data seems something, the term seemed to be one that focused on sort of um, delighting geeks and you know focus on the kind of the happenstance of the volumes of data not on on the, the functional gains from using this sort of data but over time I've come to understand that actually um, the term has some significance and we'll talk about that um, I prefer data science and, and talk about data science science around you know large um, uh, large amounts, but also uh, 
several other characteristics of data. And I'd like to give a flavor of this without getting caught up in the name. Richard Feynman once said when he was young, his father took him aside. He was one of the most famous physicists in the 20th century, if you don't know him, uh, Nobel Prize winner. Um, his, his dad took him aside when he was young and he said, um, Dick, you have to understand 95% of the arguments in the world are about labels. And Dick Feynman said, uh, he said, you know, over time, he realized there was a lot of wisdom in his father's words, but he had to respectfully disagree. And, you know, once he became 65 or 60 or 65, he, he said, you know, I, um, I, I respectfully disagree with my father. I, I don't, I don't, there's a lot of that. It's not 95%, it's more like 98% of the arguments in the world are about labels. Um, so, uh, that way he was, he said, he underestimated how much how much this was the case. So I'm not going to get caught up in labels. I, I don't like getting caught up in, in labels as a general rule. Here, ladies and gentlemen, are some examples of big data. And I'll tell you certain characteristics that are shared between all of them. Twitter feeds, feeds from Facebook and other social networks, Instagram, Snapchat, um, uh, you know, uh, WeChat, what have you. Um, uh, environmental sensors uh, send data increasingly frequently on everything from nitrous oxides, sulfur dioxides, uh, weather measurements, uh, etc. And in our buildings, our buildings are robots these days. They measure the humidity, the temperature uh, of air, and in many cases, they regulate it effectively. <laughs> Evidently, not all. Um, <laughs> but they are measuring this many times a minute around us. Um, lab and so are hospitals, long-term care facilities in modern buildings, et cetera. Lab test results, point of sale records. Uh, so when you go purchase something, there's records created. We've worked quite a lot with data from pharmacies, for example, on purchasing patterns related to, um, uh, to items for, for mosquito protection due to the occurrence of mosquito-borne illness. Um, administrative data. Um, like we might uh, get out of uh, large-scale population-wide databases in Canada or, or here in Australia. Um, questionnaire responses delivered to individuals uh, on, online or on their phones and retained uh, in, in large amounts, perhaps multiple times a day. Um, sequence data, data from uh, molecular epi instruments to measure pathogens and their molecular fingerprints or whole genome sequences. Uh, voice audio data. Um, uh, incoming outgoing call data. Um, uh, uh, measurements are data sets that measure people's proximity to, um, to cell towers. Winchell's done a fair bit of analysis uh, with that. Um, health information browsing behavior. Consumer electronic device sensors this has been a big focus mark. We have measuring things like accelerometry uh, to get physical activity, proximity using Bluetooth or Wi Fi and location using GPS, um, uh, magnetometry, uh, temperature and humidity and pressure sensors. These are all packed into these sort of devices, our phones these days, et cetera. And they're packed in for very prosaic reasons. We have accelerometers so that when we, we rotate the phone, it adjusts automatically. But they can be used to give understanding of, 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 of activity levels as well and, and the type of activity. So what are some distinguishing features? A grab bag of things, but they all share certain characteristics. Volume, yes, that's the big, the big data. And I think it's actually a real, with, with a lot of regret, that I think this is the characteristic found out. Because volume is, it's significant. It's lots of evidence that's there at some level. But the other three, I think, are even more significant. And more, they bring more to the table. Velocity. It's high temporal resolution. So from our smartphones, from our system that I'll be de detailing, uh, we might get measurements once every two minutes from, from my physical activity level, where I am, who's nearby me, um, uh, what questionnaires I'm, I'm answering, what's the, the humidity level around me, et cetera. Um, uh, so velocity, um, tweets, um, we, we get about a million a, a month that we archive from Saskatchewan that are known to occur within our province. Um, uh, it's about one per person in the population. Um, the US is about 60 million, 60 million plus now, that was from a few years ago, uh, active Twitter users. Um, 
a, a decent segment of the population, not, not most, um, but these come in at very, very high rates. I think each second it's dozens to hundreds of tweets come in per second. Um, uh, variety, ladies and gentlemen. Not only these high velocity, but, but we can pick up a lot. On, on this given phone, it can pick up information on my survey responses, on my proactive indications of barriers to support uh, to physical activity um, around me. It can pick up information on, yes, my location and social context and my physical activity and uh, aspects of the environment around me, such as whether it's light or not, that can give clues as to whether uh, I'm up and about at night or whether I'm still sleeping, et cetera. Um, and we can get similar data from smart watches. And all this can be cross-linked. It's not a matter that each is captured in isolation. They can be linked together in effective ways. Um, and the fact that we can link them can allow for sort of a triangulation of understanding. I can figure out whether I'm likely to be inside or outside using the data collected by the phone through multiple sensors. We can look at the pressure level. We can look at aspects of the temperature. We can look at how much GPS signal we're getting because it has trouble coming in big buildings. We can look at how strong the Wi-Fi is. We can look at how strong Bluetooth signals are and use that information to collectively deduce am I probably outside or not. I could look at my GPS speed um, and, and, and reason about the likelihood that I'm engaged in that sort of speed outside. Um, finally, veracity. And the point here is not that every measurement is super, super accurate. The point is that physical measures, number one, physical measures, such as location, are often much less subject to self-report but and biases and, and reporting, reporting biases, recall biases, um, than are, are traditional ways of reporting that information. Um, proximity sensors pick up with much greater confidence in someone's recall who they spent time around. Um, the physical measures that we can make out of many things are more reliable than self-report. And moreover, even if you ask questions about someone, you can ask them questions at time close to the, the events of interest. Maybe it's exposures to a park. Why did you come to this park? You trigger that while they're in the park. Or you ask them questions about when they last ate. Um, at times, they might well be eating based on on guesses from where they are, um, how long they've been there, um, and they're answering it with it fresh in their mind rather than a month from now. Um, we do the, we did this a lot with uh, foodborne illness and you know allowing people to report that they're feeling sick, uh, and and we had measurements of their actual food consumption based on their reporting, and uh, could put those two together. So I'd like to give an example for where we collect information. And this was with our, our system, which has been around since about 2009 now. We first rolled out our first system of this sort uh, around just before, actually just during the flu pandemic, if any of you remember that, 2009, 2010. And it's gone through multiple generations now. It's available on Android iPhone uh, and, and iPhone, on smartphones. And it runs generally on participant smartphones. People just run it as an app. They download it for the, play, the Apple Store or the Google Play, and they, they load and put it on their app. So they're carrying it around on their own phone, which is great because they have incentives to carry the phone. Um, it collects data periodically, like every few minutes, and, um, and uh, it collects diverse sensor modalities so we'll be talking about. So it picks up all sorts of information. In addition to asking questionnaires on the device, and it allows them to, to, to say things, uh, to volunteer information, as we say, crowdsourced information. For example, saying, you know, I removed a tick from myself, or I, I'm reporting a rash that I found. Uh, this is for Lyme disease, which is a big issue in the States. Um, so, and, and a growing issue in Canada, growing concern in Canada. And it turns out rashes are fairly diagnostic of it, certain type of, because of bullseye rash. And it turns out that, you know, ticks are, are the carrier, they're the vector associated with it. Um, but we're also interested in their exposure to advisories to, in, in as much as it affects their, their risk perception. Okay, um, and we have some extra modules to this to monitor communicational behavior, to pick up infor from information from smartwatches, 
um, from social media, um, uh, from, from uh, weight scales that were done in the past, et cetera. We've used this system for dozens of studies. So I won't go into this. But um, a foremost goal of this is security and confidentiality. All this in contrast to the massive amounts of similar data collected by Google, by Apple, by you know, uh, Microsoft and lots of others, our, all our studies go through informed consent. It goes through a meaningful informed consent where people in plain English are uh, given understanding of, uh, of what types of data they're, they can collect. They can snooze the data collection at any point, stop it for a defined time, so they can say, I want to opt out for the next hour. Um, and in fact, they can opt out of particular sensors uh, when it comes to the, uh, the, group, uh, the uh, Android version of the app. Um, soon enough, it may actually be in place now, but soon enough they'll be able to log in and retroactively delete data they're not comfortable with. Um, it has on-device encryption, secure transmission, and, and, um, and we censor certain data that's, um, that would, might otherwise be uh, too, um, too identifying. Um, okay. Um, so. I won't go into this. Uh, let's talk about where does this sort of data collected from these sort of devices go. We think about this together with big model, uh, 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 with dynamic modeling. We'll be, be talking about the opportunities together, uh, but using them together. Well, one area goes into parameters of the model, assumptions in the model. So for example, the frequency of eating homemade versus non-homemade non foods in model of foodborne illness or the frequency of care-seeking behavior given mild to moderate foodborne possible um, distress, gastrointestinal distress. Um, the duration of illness, duration where and when food is consumed, um, uh, the impact of, of that illness on food-seeking behavior. These are types of things we might put into a model that is representing aspects of, of, of foodborne illness. By contrast, in other cases, we might calibrate a model to to data that's, that results from the system and we compare data from the model and we adjust model assumptions so that they best match. For example, the frequency of foodborne illness occurrence or time until violations are identified within restaurants or other vendors. Um, uh, now, those are two uses that are very common. A third one that I'm gonna really emphasize relates to Kim's question yesterday. Um, and that's to learn from intervention effects. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most exciting things here about big data with dynamic modeling, the thing that, that, that excites me most deeply is the fact that we're going to be able to use data from the world to cross-check model results, not only at an overall level, but at the level of particular pathways. To what degree did this model expectations fall flat because it was off in terms of sedentary behavior versus moderate to vigorous physical activity. To what degree was it off because of uh, the model anticipated greater use of, of, um, of the healthy foods from the area, whereas actually the, the diet didn't change that much. Because we'll be able to more reliably measure these things that are hard to measure using traditional instruments, we can compare them with model expectations that are also fine-grained and spot areas the model needs to be improved with greater clarity. Rather than just having a, an overall outcome and trying to have to sleuth down where was the model off that might have affected that outcome, we can actually focus on particular pathways. Um, the final thing, which, which is going to be huge, and which is going to occupy um, one or two sessions later in the week, is this issue of taking a model. Ladies and gentlemen, let's if I exhibit my full enthusiasm about this, it would be, um, it would be untoward. Um, uh, the idea here is, ladies and gentlemen, models that we build we have to be humble modelers, and we should be skeptical modelers. The models that we build, even if they are exquisitely crafted with, with greatest attention to detail and greatest knowledge brought to bear, they will inevitably diverge in their expectations from what's observed in the world. Why? Because they omit things. They include simplifications. They they have inaccuracies in the measurements. 
or because certain things that were measured very accurately and put into the model change in the world. We don't know what way they'll change. And because there are stochastic factors in the model that we can't possibly predict with, with certainty in the model. We may represent those stochastic factors in the model, but we don't know which way they're going to turn out in the world. And if they turn out one way in the world, it may have one implication for our modeling. If they turn out another way, it has a different implication. And the deal here is that we have techniques based on machine learning that you'll be learning about in another two days, which will take data being gathered on an ongoing basis from these sorts of systems. Maybe it's municipal sensors. Maybe it's from social media. Maybe it's from, from people carrying smartphones participating in a study. We have techniques which will take that data, combine it with model expectations, and correct the model's expectation of what's going on now so that it can look forward with greater confidence, that it's grounded in the latest evidence about what the case is. And it doesn't become ever more out of date. It's brought ever back into sync with what's the current situation so we can use it to, to predict forward. And we're using this in a very exciting way um, with some of our partners uh, to, to examine some of the issues um, with some of the recent work, which Winchell has helped craft in the childhood infectious disease area with Alberta Health Services. Okay, let's just take a, 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 a look at how this applies. A lot of fancy terms here. Let's just take a look how it applies to particular cases. Take foodborne illness. This is an example model built, um, uh, built by a student, Sarah McPhee Knowles, now modified by another student, Aiden Tehui. Um, um, we have an agent population of consumers, food vendors, and inspectors. Consumers, ladies and gentlemen, eat food. My uh, colleague, Cheryl Waldner, of is, is an expert in foodborne illness and vet, uh, Western College of Veterinary Medicine. She tells me that of all the foods that she worries about foodborne illness in, she studies the food chain and occurrences of foodborne illness. The one she worries about the most is cantaloupe. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> because of uh, issues with the outer surface of the cantaloupe uh, catching pathogen, and retaining it. It has these kind of crenellated areas that, that can take pathogen. And, um, and, and then when the cantaloupe is cut, that gets transmitted via, sorry, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, in any case, um, consumers consume food. Sometimes with gusto. Um, food vendors sell food. You just ate it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And inspectors, ladies and gentlemen, um, sometimes they live a little bit dangerously, but um, <laughs> inspectors circulate around, inspect restaurants or vendors, and uh, they do so in a, in a sort of a round robin fashion until there's an outbreak. And once an outbreak, or there's a perceived outbreak, once they believe there's an outbreak, they'll switch to a mode of trying to locate the source of the outbreak based on reports. This is quite similar to how it goes on in Canada. Um, Public Health Agency of Canada is, is quite involved in this, and we've been pleased to be able to collaborate with them related to this work. Um, and there's a spatially explicit environment. So the idea here is we have this, if we draw it as causal loop diagram, we have some, um, uh, we have some risk awareness on the part of individuals, risk perception that might affect seeking food at vendors. There's uh, contaminated vendors, and sometimes warmer weather, which does occur in our area of the world. Um, <laughs> sometimes drives uh, the contamination. Think about trucks outside, for example, um, and, and the risk of contamination of a falafel truck. At MIT, it was called the feel awful truck. Uh. Um, and and I, did, I did once have some issues with it. Um, uh, so contaminated vendors combined with food seeking vendors leads to exposure to contaminated food on the part of individuals. And some of that leads to subclinical illnesses. And one of the challenges, the foremost challenges of managing foodborne illness is that something like 99.8% of cases of foodborne illness go undiagnosed. People suffer at home, it's very unpleasant, they may, may miss days of work but it goes unreported. But a small number of cases are clinical, and that brings them into uh, contact with the care system in ways that sometimes lead to reports, case reports to public health. 
and that leads to an outbreak investigation once they reach a certain volume. There's an investigation that goes on, and this is based on accuracy of recall. Now, I want to highlight something for you. I think I, like many of you, um, uh, perhaps, was encumbered, I certainly was encumbered by a notion before beginning this work that foodborne illness strikes within hours. In fact, there's important categories of foodborne illness that last weeks, okay, and that don't present for quite a few days. And what, what goes on is they actually ask people who have gotten ill, who might have gotten ill two weeks ago, about what they ate, you know, two weeks ago on each day of the week. And people have a terrible time recalling what they ate. Um, but based on recall, where people ate, where they went, and so on, um, based on these terribly flawed, uh, flawed bits of recall, where they purchased food, what supermarkets, etc., when they went, they're going to try to find contaminating vendors. And this process is often a prolonged process of trying to track down the contaminated vendors. Because it's a lot of sleuthing based on very, very spotty self-reporting from a very small fraction of people who actually were affected. Most people probably got sick and never told anyone. Um, and, and eventually those contaminated vendors are hopefully found and removed, uh, corrected, and uh, the system corrects itself. So just to give you a sense of this, here are some consumers. Healthy, an individual can be in a healthy state, they could have secured health exposure, and this is in a latent state, and they either go on to clinical or subclinical levels of illness. Um, for food vendors, they're either a safe restaurant or contaminated restaurant. Either they're currently cleared of contamination or they're contaminated. Um, an inspector is either engaged in routine inspection or they're engaged in outbreak investigation or, um, or they're involved in sort of uh, going through reports and, and identifying the priorities. Now, there's some big uncertainties here. If we think about building a model like this, we built a model and it's published. Um, and there are several big uh, uncertainties in that model. What is the accuracy of people's recall um, of this? Of, of where they ate. Um, how many subclinical illnesses are there? You know, I talked with Cheryl about it, Cheryl Walner. She said, um, this expert in, in foodborne illness, she, she, I said, so I guess um, subclinical illnesses um, are like the, um, or the, the clinical illnesses are just the tip of the iceberg, the subclinical are a much larger area. She said, no, clinical illnesses are like the spike on the very top of the iceberg. <laughs> um, it's, it's that bad, and so this is a big area of question mark. Um, food seeking, risk perception, impact on risk perception, risk awareness, uh, awareness of um, uh, possible uh, concerns involving particular vendors. These are big question marks. Um, so, so let's talk about the smartphone-based instruments we use to probe this. So for example, we might ask for this, this is a particular study. Most of these studies can be created with uh, the study was, like most, created with uh, no programming involved. We just, we just uh, can go specify we want a study like this that measures these things, that has these survey instruments that we describe graphically online, and it will create a, a little study like this. Um, here, you can ask, okay, you could say, a person can say with a button, I'm feeling sick, and if they report feeling ill, um, they'll ask, for example, did you consult a healthcare professional? Um, is it possible, this is a high population of students, do you suspect your illness may be alcohol related? Um, <laughs> and they can, uh, they can report you know, the nature of the symptoms. Um, you know, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, et cetera. And we ask these questions so we can narrow down what is plausibly um, uh, r related to foodborne illness. Um, so from this study, um, we had um, a pretty good uh, set of, of data. This, this was from uh, a group of about 80 individuals. And you could see that um, most individuals during the course of the three months had no, no occurrences of, of illness that they reported. Um, but a significant fraction reported one, two, three, or more uh, illnesses here. Um, and this is the, the cumulative number, um, uh, cumulative fraction um, that report different levels of illness. They could also indicate when they're eating. And when they were eating, we asked them to report what they ate to take a photo of it and explain what the food is. Okay? And the volume of reports that we got was, was incredible here. 
And, um, and the level of reporting about what the nature of the food was was in many cases actually very good. So you know, we had photos of it, and then we had audio responses, or we had, um, uh, we had um, some, some typed uh, responses as to the nature of the food. Um, the important thing is we knew where it was coming from, so we knew if it was home cooked or, or, or brought, from, brought from outside. So this is the number of food consumption reports we got over the course of this three months from different individuals. You can see here, while well, I'd say it's reasonably big data, because uh, for this survey alone, which is just one of many, um, here you know, we had individuals who varied uh, between um, you know, no reports. We had three individuals with no reports at all. And the maximum report from one individual is 380. Um, cases of, of, illness, of, of, of food uh, that, that occurred. The 50% mark was somewhere around 100 reports over those, those three months, which is just over one a day, which is not bad, not, not bad. It's, it's, it's by no means perfect. We had quite a few that were well upwards of 100. If we think about, for example, 180 here, that's kind of on average two a day that they were reporting um, with, uh, as, as part of their, their eating habits. Now, if you look at this from a temporal perspective, this shows three different individuals. And they're eating at home, green, eating at a vendor, or, or non-home cooked food, orange, feeling sick, red. And you can start to appreciate this is top, this is finely spaced temporal data for picking this over time. It's it's actually asking these questions anytime during the day. It measures their location, their their proximity to um, to others, I believe, but also uh, activity levels, etc. Um, about every five minutes. And here we have um, their eating behavior and food illness behavior. Now we're doing some work with uh, statistical models on this in addition to our dyna dynamic models, look at recurrent events, for example. To what degree does the occurrence of eating food at a restaurant enhance the hazard rate for, for becoming sick, the, the chance per unit time for becoming sick. But you can see it's quite, it's quite space that you could see this was 1st February 11th, 21st, etc. So we got quite a few reports. They're fairly dense, particularly for some individuals. Um, uh, meanwhile, we were asking them questions uh, beyond what they reported to cross-check their results and elicit more information. So we'd ask, you know, did you eat in a restaurant today? If so, you know, did, did you eat takeout or ready-to-eat food? Um, uh, did you eat take leftovers home? And we'd ask these sort of questions. And these sort of questions were very well answered. You could see here, this is a fraction, so it's a histogram. Um, a given person in the study would be in one bin or another. And an individual, if they were, say, in the 65 bin, it meant that they answered between 65% and 70% of the questionnaires asked of them. And so what you could see is people were pretty good at answering the questionnaires. We had a very large fraction that were upwards of 90% in terms of answering, which is, by today's standards of questionnaire answering, pretty darn good. Why? Because we're asking micro questionnaires. Questionnaires they could rip through, submit very, very quickly, and, and do so with minimal, minimal hassle. Pops up on their phone, they can choose when to answer it uh, if, if desired, they can do so immediately. And we get a tagged indication of when they answered the entire questionnaire as well as each question on it. Um, so here you know, are some examples through the website for browsing the results for the study. This is for study administrators, so they could see when did they answer it, what were their answers, when, you know, at what point. And we can also map out, we can also map out where they answer where they answered certain questions, right? So to give you a sense of the volume of data here, the big and big data, um, although it's in my view kind of the less interesting characteristic, um, we had uh, from the study about 4,800 survey responses. Um, about 7.5 million GPS locations, which will be very relevant in a minute for where they were exposed to eating food, for example. Um, accelerometer, somewhere over 90 million. Gyroscope, uh, 120 million. And um, Wi-Fi records, about 8.8 .8 million, which are useful for figuring out where they are inside, amongst other things, and are they inside or outside. So 
And looking at people's responses, there's some covariations here. So this is a scatter plot. A given person is a dot in the scatter plot. The X location of that dot indicates the fraction of EMAs that they answer, these ecological momentary assessments, these little micro questionnaires that they're posed. And the Y location indicates the number of times they reported food eating. So this individual, 518, had about 80% response rate to the EMAs. Separate instrument from reporting food where they had something like uh, 125 food reports over the 90 days. Okay? And what you'll see here is generally an, an upwards trend that suggests that people who, who report more EMAs tend to also report more, more uh, occurrences of eating. Although there are some people who are very, very good at reporting and answering EMAs who have very few, uh, very uh, comparatively few uh, reports of food. I mean, um, no more than, say, 50 over the 90 days or something along those lines. Now, we can map out, because all these things are cross-linked, this data, we can map out where people ate, right? Where did they eat their food? When they reported their food, where were they? Because hmm? um, it's all GPS tagged or Wi-Fi tagged. Where are they in town here? Um, and here, a color indicates a particular person. Um, so like this person ate at different times here. Each dot is one occurrence of eating, and it's uh, geolocated uh, based on, on that person's location. Now, if we ask, wh where were they eating within 24 hours before an illness report? So if we consider, where did they eat within a day before they reported feeling sick, we can narrow this down further. Right? We can narrow it down to certain, certain locations. Um, there's certain clustering, which are, some of which are unclo uncomfortably close to where I work. Um, <laughs> and certain places where I think Windchill has been known to, to also um, partake of food as a, as a body. Um, so, okay, so this is large volumes of data. It is temporally fine-grained data, right? It's, it's quite temporally fine-grained. It is high variety data in the sense that we have cross-linked sensor data with what they've reported. Um, and it is data which picks up things that are hard to self-report from memory. Where have you eaten? Where have you gone recently? Where did you engage in food-seeking behavior? Um, how does that have to do with that model? Well, the deal here is we can bring the two together, ladies and gentlemen. We can bring the two together. Recall these model elements that I walked through earlier. We had this model before we did this, and uh, before we did this work with the smartphones. And here, ladies and gentlemen, you may re remember that there's certain types of information that we need to gather to inform the model. Maybe we want to calibrate, we want to cross-check model predictions for a number of cases reported in the model, see how representative it is for a given jurisdiction. Right? We want to see for Saskatoon, if we model the situation, is it capturing the dynamics pretty well for the city? Um, number of contaminated vendors that were identified and, and closed, for example, occurrence of warmer weather. We, we can get data on these things through fairly traditional data sources. But the problem is that there's lots of other areas, like accuracy of recall, occurrence of subclinical illnesses, um, aspects of food seeking that are very hard to elicit reliably through traditional instruments. Getting people to report where they ate three weeks ago from memory is, is hard. So for some of these, we can parameterize it. For example, this issue here of to what degree are people um, going in and, and, and seeking care for, for a given level of highly credible gastrointestinal illness. Um, that's something we can put into the model, into the degree to which illness exposure leads to clinical or subclinical care, se or, or, or clinical care seeking. Um, uh, we can look at duration, how long they stay ill, and how long it affects their, their eating behavior. Um, but one of the most, and, and we could also look at some calibration issues, like where we're calibrating to the number of, of clinical illnesses or clinical illnesses that people are reporting. But one of the most important things, the, the areas that I think that this confluence offers the greatest potential, ladies and gentlemen, is this one, learning from intervention effects. The idea here is that um, we can, okay, this is, 
this is actually, I'm going to skip forward to that. Here, here's, here's the issue with this. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, if, if we're interested in understanding the degree to which an intervention does or does not improve things, we have with this type of data the ability to resolve certain pathways. With foodborne illness, we can tell the degree to which someone is seeking uh, food in the community, what sorts of food they are seeking. And if we see an intervention, say, in terms of making available information on a vendor's rating, for you know, history, compliance rating, inspection reports, we could actually look at to what degree is, is use of that information uh, changing an individual's behavior based on people saying, have you visited that site, or based on our monitor and communicational behavior. A version of our system, or our system as an extension, a plugin that allows it to monitor which websites is a person visiting with consent, of course, by that individual, um, and with the ability to pause that uh, data collection if desired. So within our system, ladies and gentlemen, we can actually ask to the degree, you know, to what degree is the, um, the intervention affecting certain types of behavior as opposed to others? We can ask to what degree is it affecting food-seeking behavior as a whole compared to which, to which vendors you go? To what degree are you going to a smaller variety of vendors versus an equal variety to before the intervention. These are things we can pick up. Or if we think about this case earlier with moving to opportunity, or thinking about the effects of obesity, using smartphone-based data um, on sensors as well as the self-reporting and, and the, uh, the, the uh, ecological momentary assessments, we can measure to the degree to which it's associated with moderate to vigorous change in physical activity, sedentary behavior, dietary behavior as reported by, by, by photos, um, and as reported by some pro temporally proximate questions. Um, and we can even link it in with data on BMI as measured by weight scales, like we've done from some studies where the phone actually measures when someone's weighing themselves either it automatically through Bluetooth enabling of weight scales will measure it, or they take a photo of the, the measurement on the weight scale, and it will use that as you know, their, their known weight because it's recorded by a photo in the system. So we can actually see when we have an intervention, to what degree is it affecting one pathway or another? But what's most important when thinking about dynamic modeling, ladies and gentlemen, is that our dynamic model often includes multiple pathways as well. We capture in our dynamic model representation of multiple pathways. And when we compare model expectations for how these pathways might have been changed with what the smartphones suggest in terms of how they were actually changed by the intervention, it allows us to more quickly zero in on cases where the model is off base in its representation, where we have overestimated the model the gain in moderate to vigorous physical activity and underestimated the change in sedentary behavior. Or where we, we did not, we anticipated a big change in healthiness of diet, but in fact that's not realized for the first year because people's food, food seeking behavior patterns have, have not been altered yet. These are things we can compare between what the model expe expects on the one hand and what's actually picked up with the sensors. And we can use that to learn more effectively to improve the model. Remember my point, models as learning prostheses with, with uh, linguistic assistance from the Sage of Sydney. Um, uh, the, the, the realization here is that models are not crystal balls. They are tools to learn more quickly, more robustly, more deeply from empirical data. This is one way we do so. We have a model that captures our theory of the world. We can compare its expectations against actual data that's also articulated at a per pathway level in contrast to traditional data, and we can use that to improve the model. Zero in on the understanding. But the issue is not so much improve the model. The issue is improve our thinking about the situation, improve our knowledge, our understanding of the situation as captured by that model. The model is a tool for capturing that updated understanding, but the most important understanding is ones that we have in our head to capture our understanding of, of improved understanding of, for example, how quickly healthiness of diet is likely to change in the event of an intervention that involves some move to a mixed income neighborhood. 
So here, this sort of data we're talking about from big data, it's one of its primary benefits in the dynamic modeling space uh, is, is one that I think is unappreciated here. Almost no one's talking about it. I think I'm the only one I've ever heard talking about it. It's a lonely, it's lonely here. Um, and that is, it allows us to learn more quickly from empirical evidence in ways that improves our thinking by improving the modeling and our, our reasoning about the underlying situation. And that's a very big change because traditional data, if you're just dealing with, you know, you have some move, uh, move to a mixed income neighborhood, you have some obesity outcome in terms of it was significantly lowered or not, um, and you have only very poor ways of measuring the intermediate pathways you know, moderate to vigorous physical activity, sedentary behavior, healthiness of diet. If you are very poor measurements, you're kind of guessing what, what fell short. Okay, so for young men, young African-American men, we didn't see uh, any gain in, 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 you know, health gain for obesity levels. They stayed more or less uh, the same. There's no statistically significant change. Why? Why did it fall short? Maybe we really increased moderate business, vigorous physical activity, but sedentary behavior compensated for that. They spent more time at home and and it ended up canceling the change. It's a game It's a game in speculation if we just have course outcomes. We don't know. But with this sort of high resolution data, we can zero in on what changed and we can improve our intervention better and we can improve our model along the way. And we can use it to anticipate, use the model to anticipate what interventions might work better next time. Using that improved understanding, we asked with the model about counterfactual interventions we haven't tried yet. Okay, so maybe sedentary behavior was the weak point in our strategy. What could we do that would improve that? And you focus on interventions that might improve that, you use the model to study them, having incorporated the findings from this earlier study, and you find a better intervention yet. We go from throwing darts in the dark, you know, for, for uh, intervention design, I'm exaggerating a bit, but you know, operating with, with real limitations in, in finding effective interventions to being able to see with more clarity why we're failing, where we're falling short, and how to improve it using, using model as a tool. That's the vision that I have with respect to this last type of integration um, here, learning from intervention effects, ladies and gentlemen. But we did a further, um, we did a, a, a further step, too, when it came to interventions. We actually asked, suppose we were to provide two individuals in the community um, a way for them to report occurrences of subclinical illness. And at the time they reported, they could be asked a little bit about their fruit-seeking behavior. But more to the point, they could enable us to keep in escrow data on their location so that if there looked to be a plausible case there was an outbreak, that the healthcare system would have access to their location data. Would know where they ate in the couple days before they grew sick. So that data is being collected automatically, but it would not be used by, it wouldn't be examined by, it wouldn't be analyzed by the healthcare system except under an, uh, an event which might be an outbreak, you know, the, declare, the declaration of a possible outbreak. And the idea here is they're reporting subclinical illness, which fills in a big, a big gap in terms of, uh, of uh, detecting outbreaks. Because right now we're operating clinical illnesses which are very rare, and it leads to a big delay in how quickly an outbreak can be declared. With subclinical illnesses, we have much greater statistical power because we may go from, you know, a couple cases a month to hundreds of cases a month, and we can detect statistical variability deviance, you know, associated with that, that sort of statistical regime much more easily. So here, ladies and gentlemen, the goal was to, to build in ability to use some location tracking, but also um, uh, subclinical reporting is the key element. And it was very interesting. Um, so we examined this in a paper. Um, and uh, what we found is that suppose we only had a small fraction of the population carrying this, this app. Maybe less than 5%. We examined 1%, 2%, and 4% of the population carrying this app to report this sort of thing. Um, uh, 
Now, let's suppose now that we consider a scenario where we have an outbreak and we are examining how many people get sick from subclinical illness before that outbreak is squashed, before it's eliminated, until it's you know, identified, sources identified and eliminated. What we found is basically that with a baseline situation, um, we had something like on, as a median, 200 cases of subclinical illness before the outbreak was, was quashed. So there might only be a few, you know, two to five clinical cases, but 200 subclinical. Those people might be pretty miserable. It didn't bring them into the hospital for sure, but they might have been pretty miserable in the meantime. Um, might have missed work, absenteeism issues. Um, might have been present at work, but under effective presenteeism. So it varied, and we, as we typically do with these models, which are stochastic, it's an age-based model in English, we ran the model again and again and again, and we show here a box plot for different runs of it with different so-called random number seeds, different happenstance of the random numbers. We had between about 100 and 375 cases in, the, in this uh, central quartile set. Um, and then there were some outliers that went up above 1,000, okay? Um, so this is 25% and 75% um, uh, quantiles. Um, okay, we examined several counterfactual situations, okay? So that's the baseline. What if we were to have sentinels who reported, for example, uh, subclinical symptoms here, but they did not report location? Okay. Turns out we could do pretty darn well, even without the location data. The fact that they are reporting, yes, I'm feeling ill, even though in many cases it might not be due to a case of a vendor-caused foodborne illness, it could really reduce by about a factor of two the number of cases that occur before the infection is cut off if you have 4% sentinels. With 1% sentinels, there's a pretty marginal difference. If only one out of 100 people carry the app, it's really not enough. 2%, you're starting to make a significant difference. 4%, you've made a big difference. You have about half the number of cases in the median. Um, if you combine that also with location data, where they visited using their, their locations recently, um, you can get another another decrease yet um, uh, be, below that, but it's not it's not uh, comparable. But you get something like a sixty percent decrease in the number of, of cases uh, before the infection is stamped out, which is pretty significant. This is with four percent of the population carrying it. You're not talking about everyone in the population having to report. You're talking about a small number of people who are call them compliant or adherent enough to be willing to report subclinical symptoms. Pretty significant, pretty significant. Um, I, think I'll, I think I'll leave that there and we're gonna switch over to, um, uh, to uh, some hands-on work in the final uh, 40 minutes or so here before lunch. But I do wanna highlight the fact that this work, I also will include in my slides a set of other little case studies. For example, tobacco and nicotine product choice, where people seek, seek um, uh, tobacco and nicotine products such as e-cigarettes and go and purchase them. And we look at, for example, use behavior for e-cigarettes versus cigarettes over time by particular individuals, trying to understand the degree to which one interacts with the other. You know, does e-cigarette use defer on average use of a cigarette or is it simply an accompaniment uh, for a cigarette? Um, where are they eating, where are they, um, where are they uh, using the, um, engaging the behavior, uh, both, both sort of geographically and, and socially at what, what times of the day, what are the nicotine levels, these are all things we, inve we investigated in empirical studies and what prompted them to smoke a cigarette. While they're actually temporally proximate to it, they can report, okay, this was the triggering mechanism or this one. We have another study um, just starting up on HIV AIDS with a lot of the individuals being um, homeless, uh, homeless individuals. We're actually giving out phones uh, for that study. And, um, and here we have a, a different set of model, uh, model elements and a different set of 
of needs where are taking photos of, of pills at the time they're taking them in sort of a remote, directly observed therapy context. And then finally, some work in suicide prevention, um, suicidal ideation and mental health um, with, uh, with some models built over here um, and with uh, mobile technologies um, that involved uh, Andrew, Andrew Page here, as well as some work uh, done with inpatient populations back in Saskatchewan. Um, Okay, uh, yes, I will come back to this. This is just a forward note that one of the most powerful uses of these, uh, of these types of data collection is to inform models that are admittedly very imperfect on an ongoing basis. So the idea is rather than having a model that we, we build, we put our hopes on it, and we use it to simulate forward and and updating it is a big deal. We have a model that's constantly being refreshed with the latest evidence, constantly brought, being brought up to date using evidence that comes in. Here we have susceptible, uh, here we have a very simple model. A model that might be cobbled together very quickly for an emerging infectious disease. Think H1N1, think SARS, think MERS, you know, any number of these different emerging infectious diseases where the evidence is just not very good when we're assembling the model. Just like Kim asked, what if the data is not available? Ladies and gentlemen, it's not a good reason not to model because, as Jeff said, we're modeling in our heads all the time. We want to put it down in an explicit way, but the model is going to be is going to be challenged because it may have a lot of inaccuracies. Instead of just trusting it may be pretty good and experimenting it, we can do a lot better these days with incoming data. We can constantly reground this model in the latest evidence to keep it current. So at least it doesn't diverge from what we observe in the world. And we can then use it to look forward, having learned from the data that has come in. Having learned from that data that has come in to help refine its parameter values, for example. So ladies and gentlemen, we're experimenting, and you'll probably hear a guest lecture on this later in the week, with techniques that will take data to a certain point use it to better estimate what are parameter values, but especially the latent state of the model. These are dynamically varying parameters, stochastically varying parameters, and the latent state of the model. And then use it from that point on to predict forward. And one of the things you'll find is, uh, Winchell's been highly involved in this, was, as, as, as usual, has been a leading person in applying latest uh, methodological innovations. So here, we're predicting forward from time 20 using only data received to that point predicting forward from time 28, using data available to that point from time 35. This is a model that is quite far off at first, but as data comes in, it gets more and more confident about what's likely to happen going forward. Um, and it's corrected. So if it does have flaws, and it most certainly does, we limit them by, by updating the model on an ongoing basis. The analogy I'd like to use here, ladies and gentlemen, with my students is, uh, I'm sure for, for most of you, some of you have flown into town and are grateful for your coming such distance. Others of you live within town. And for all of you, you know how to get back to your hotel or your, your home quite readily from here. It's, it's a straightforward exercise. You have a good mental model of it. But you would never dream of making that trip back to your home, back to your hotel with your eyes closed. <laughs> I mean, you'll be madness. You'd be a fool's errand, right? You'd be struck by a bus. You'd cross the street at the wrong time. Wrong time. You'd be run down by a Sydney cyclist. Um, you might, you might run afoul of, you know, a, a bit of um, an open manhole that, that uh, has a, has, uh, you know, right in the middle of the sidewalk has a sign, but you go right down into it because you're walking with your eyes closed. You're, you're not getting updates on where you are, and even if. Even if there's none of those terrible things befall you, you'll be getting further and further off in your understanding your best guess about where you are compared to where you actually are. At first, as you start to walk down to the elevator, you'll be pretty sure. But by the time you go five minutes, you'll start to get more and more uncertain about where you are. And it's like that with models, ladies and gentlemen. A model left to its own devices run forward with no new data coming in, open loop, as we say. It gets further and further off from from what's observed in the world. It may have been finely tuned 
early on to start at a reasonable state, but now it's getting further and further off. Stochastics happen. Just like in the world, stoplights, you know, turn at way, in ways you can't uh, expect while you're walking with your eyes closed, so it is with, with models. Things happen. The model may have a great description of the process, but it doesn't know what the realization of the process outcome is going to be. You know, maybe it's going to be, you know, bad flu season, and the model's not going to be able to anticipate that directly. What we want, ladies and gentlemen, is models that stay savvy. They stay informed with the latest evidence. They stay they stay attuned to the latest situation. It's like you being able to open your eyes and peek every five seconds. You can do pretty well with that, though it might be tiring on your eyes. Um, so, so you, you know, if you if you could see where you are every every few seconds, you could do a pretty good job getting back to your hotel. Um, and so it is with these models. You're constantly being recorrected, and based on that correction. You're updating your estimates of certain parameters and your estimates of what the underlying state of the model is. These sorts of models, as, you, as this suggests, don't project forward one particular outcome. They project forward a distribution of possible outcomes. And we'll see how that comes about. But this is one of the big uses of big data, ladies and gentlemen. Temporally fine-grained, high-velocity data can be used to recurrently reground models on an ongoing basis. So one of our students, Wade McDonald, who may soon enough shed uh, step foot on the, the, the firm soil of the Australian continent, he, he is doing this for data that's hourly from hospitals, for example. Another student is doing it for data weekly from measles in the UK. Um, uh, we can get data on a daily basis. Ideally, we'd have data on an hourly basis or, or even more fine grain. And it's not too big of an ask for certain types of contexts, um, certain types of health service delivery contexts. And the big point here, ladies and gentlemen, coming from someone who's a skeptical modeler and hopefully a humble modeler, is that our models will always be falling short of what we'd like but we can help limit the extent of the adverse implications of that by regrounding them and we can learn from the incoming data. And that's what the prospect is here. Big data is not just a buzzword. It's an opportunity for learning more quickly, deeply, reliably from modeling and to use those models in a more reliable, more robust way, in a way that won't spiral off into increasing divergence from the world, but will we'll always be updated in a way that will allow us to, to look forward with, with greater confidence. Um, in any case, I think I'll uh, leave it there. I'll simply say um, grounding models, uh, dynamic models, and electronically sourced data, or big data, I think are have natural synergies. The, the data from high velocity observations from these big data, they help ground these dynamic models. The models help make sense of that data in light of intervention trade-offs. Um, the electronically sourced data can help stimulate dynamic hypotheses for what's going on at a behavioral level because it often relates to lower level behavior. And it can help cross-check model anticipated intervention results. The dynamic models, meanwhile, can help fill the gaps between the observations. Uh, and can help uh, interpret the understanding of what the implications of those observations are. In, in some cases, the models are used for, for generating data to test, to test strategies uh, as well. Um, how frequently you have to, serve, uh, to, to capture data. So, closing remarks. Empirical grounded models don't require data. In electronically captured data is increasingly ubiquitous. Commodity sensor bearing devices can serve a dual use as a sensor EMA and crowdsourcing platforms very easily, just on the device itself uh, in a very lightweight way, in a way that invites lots of responses by individuals. Um, and there's communications mechanisms around us, uh, things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, that actually allow us to derive our context, our location very well, um, in addition to, to tools like GPS focused on that. Coupled with models, sensor data can offer significant and complementary health insights. Um, Cross-linking sensor and EMA data, as well as other components, um, 
they, they offer a lot of benefits to sharpen our dynamic model, to make it more precise, to resolve different pathways in a ways that will help us learn more quickly using those models, help the models learn even more effectively. And it turns out using machine learning techniques like that particle filtering I showed you to project forward to reground the model can substantially enhance the power of dynamic modeling when used with big data. Um, and you know, a key use of this data that I see going forward that people do not seem to be talking about yet, but I'm convinced is going to be huge, is the ability to learn more quickly from intervention outcomes, successful or not, to turn a failed intervention occurrence where it fell short, far short of its hopes, and to turn that in to a success as far as learning is concerned, so that we can design a much better intervention next time that, that uh, is able to counteract the specific limitations or failings of this last intervention. I see that as, as perhaps the biggest implication and certainly one of the biggest. Anyway, I should provide acknowledgments. This, this work has been supported by many including uh, Winchell uh, back here, uh, who's, who's been a, a central contributor to a lot of this work at the, at the intersection of dynamic modeling and, and big data. Okay, So uh, thanks very much for your attention. We're going to get on now to a bit of hands-on exercise, after which we will lunch. Okay, So thank you very much. Okay.